Welcome to Revival Time Hub, the fire shall ever be burning upon the altar, it shall never go out. Give the Lord the shout! Come on, South Africa, give the Lord the shout! Shout glory! Hallelujah! Praise the Lord! It's an honor to be here tonight. I don't take it for granted for this rare privilege to be here to bring you the word of the Lord. I sincerely want to honor God's servant, Apostle Felix, and his dear wife, Pastor Mrs. Bulewa Oko, for having me here in South Africa for the first time. Thank you so much, sir. You know, your originality, your authority, and your graciousness is a combined manifestation of a man that truly has encountered God. All I can say tonight is that you are a man sent from God to be a witness to a generation. And we are honored to gather here to celebrate you and to celebrate what God is doing with you as you raise this tall altar for the revelation and the glorification of Jesus Christ. One more time, House of Treasures, can we please celebrate God's servant and his dear wife. Thank you, sir. Truly love and honor you. Thank you, man. Glory to God. I also want to honor all the servants of God that are here. God's servant has already honored you. I just want you to know that I honor you and thank you for taking our time to come share fellowship tonight. And of course, everyone hungry for an encounter. <laughs> Is that the strength of your hunger? Come on, give the Lord a shout! I don't know if you know this song, but let's begin our journey with a sound. <laughs> kadosh, 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 kadosh. He's the Lamb of God who sits upon the throne. He alone is worthy of our praise. Kados, Kados. Kados, Kados. Kados, Kados. Kados, Kados. Kados, Kados. Kados, Kados. He's the Lamb of God. He's the Lamb of God who sits upon the throne. For He alone is worthy. Yeah, I'm serious. 
Jesus of the shout Father we thank you for this rare privilege to be numbered in the beloved Tonight we have come to draw from your everlasting fountains and precious Lord we ask for the encounters that brings men into the fullness of their ordinations and grant us tonight even the grace required to metamorphose to the next version consistent with your agenda for our lives Lord take all the glory take all the praise in Jesus precious name we have declared One more time give the Lord a big clap and a shout as you take your seats in God's presence Glory Thank you so much God bless you Thank you thank you so much Glory to God Because we are starting tonight and I happen to be the first speaker <laughs> My <laughs> my burden is to bring perspective to the topic of the conference. And so I'll be spending more time just to teach and do a bit of exposition tonight. I know heavyweight apostles are coming later <laughs> to move in the power of God. I just want to make sure we understand the scope and the dimensions of the team of the conference. Glory to God. Maybe tomorrow morning I'll do a bit of revival. <laughs> Because I would have been done with expositions and exegesis. Hallelujah. So let's begin with Hebrews chapter 12 from verse 1. Looking on to Jesus. I would I would, I would drive from somewhere to arrive at my point. My point is to show you the effect of looking on to Jesus. But I'll need to lay a few foundations to help us in this sojourn. He said, we are foreseen, we also are encompassed about with so great a cloud of witness. He said, let us lay aside every weight and every sin which doth easily beset us and let us run the race with patience that is set before us. Verse 2 is my emphasis and he said looking unto Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith. He said hope for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. This scripture encapsulates God's agenda as touching human kind if you study the operations of god with humanity you will discover that god had an agenda and the agenda of god was to create a species that has the capacity to reflect him to contain him to reflect him and to exercise his dominion on the face of the earth All that God has to offer humanity is captured within the scope of this agenda. If we can contain God, if we can reflect God, then we can advance his kingdom on the face of the earth. So much so that the invincible realities can become tangible in the natural realm. So that when you come into the domain of human kind, it will almost look as if you are walking in the paradise of heaven. because the man would have had the capacity of interaction with God and so transmitting his wisdom and his counsel on the face of the earth. And so when you come into this scripture the Bible begins to draw our attention to the strategy that God put in place to restore man to this mandate. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 he said let us make man in our own image after our likeness and he said on the strength of bearing our image and carrying our righteous character he said they will sustain the capacity to exercise dominion so that the government of heaven can be reflected in the natural realm and at the time god was giving this legislation the earth realm had been shielded from all the princes that fell because man did not understand that there was war in heaven 
because there was a contention for exercise of dominion, the government and the powers of Elohim. And the princes that tried to dethrone God were cast into the earth realm. He said, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. He said, the great deceiver has come. And so when they fell into the earth realm, the vibrations that they brought into the earth caused the earth to fall into chaos. And that's why the Bible said in the beginning, after God created the earth and the, the heaven and the earth, he said the earth was void. The reason for that voidness is the judgment that visited the earth realm. When the princes fell, he said, woe to the earth. That means the domain of humankind, the domain of the earth had been destroyed. The word is tohu, bohu. It means endless waste and corruption. And so God showed back from Genesis 1 verse 3 and began to reconstruct the earth. And when God was done reconstructing the earth, he needed a vice regent that would represent his agenda on the earth. Because the princes that were saddled with that responsibility attempted rebellion. They wanted to overthrow the throne of God. Meanwhile, God was not elected, so you can't overthrow him. What, what, what they didn't understand is that the throne of God is not a seat. The throne of God is a being. <laughs> so even if God stands up and you sit where he's sitting, you are not on his throne. Because before creation was, God was. And so there's a place where God sits before thrones were created. The Bible said in 1 Timothy 6.16 that God dwells in light, unapproachable. So attempting to dethrone God is a function of ignorance. But because they have attempted, is a violation of the ordinances of heaven. So they were cast into the earth. And when the earth was destroyed, God reconstructed the earth. And now God needs another agent that will transmit his government. But for that agent to have the stature to transmit his government, that agent must bear his image so that his authority can be credited to him. That is why he began by making him in his image and in his likeness. If you bear his image and his likeness, naturally you can translate his dominion. And so the blessing of God was dominion. Because of who you are, go now and represent me and do what I can do. But the serpent that was aged, wiser than the man, sneaked into the garden and taught him the way of rebellion. So unfortunately, the man also fell. And so when the man fell, the only antidote for restoring him back to where God placed him was for God to come and model it for him to see. And so in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2, the Bible showed us the second Adam who carried the stature of God and the capacity to model God. And what the man did was that when he came, he first of all paid the price for the iniquity of man. That's why you saw that the Bible said he endured the shame for the glory that was before him. The glory is not a cloud. The glory is the generation that will emerge from his sacrifice. There was a generation that God looked out for when he began the project in Eden. A generation that when they walked, you saw God in them. You didn't need to find God in a cloud. God decided to start manifesting his glory in a cloud because there was no man to embody it. But when Jesus came, the glory of God moved from a cloud and became a person. But what God wants to achieve is not only in Christ. What God wants to achieve is to, man, ma, is to, is to mass produce carriers of divinity. That was what Jesus was looking at that made him endure the shame. But you see, there was an equation. When you have been backed into the God family, for you to sustain that glory, God now gave us a formula. He said, looking unto Jesus. Oh. You are the glory that God is looking out for. But for you to manifest that glory, he said, looking unto Jesus. <laughs> the author and the finisher of our faith. You know, serving, conferences like this are important for many reasons, but three of them stand out. Number one, they give you an opportunity to encounter God. Because every time we gather like this, His presence tabernacles there. So men will behold Christ in different dimensions so that the glory locked in can manifest. The second thing conferences like this do is that they show you the secrets of God so that you can walk in them. And then finally, they empower you so that you take from what you have seen in the conference into your sphere of influence. So the conference does not end on the last day of the meeting. The conference now continues in the bank. 
The conference continues in the market. The conference continues in every territory that everyone who participated came into. Because for the glory that was set before him, you were the glory that he saw. And he said for you to continue to manifest that glory, you must continue to look on to him. Now tonight, I will show you the effect of looking on to him. And then tomorrow, I will show you how to look on to him. Elohim Adonai. Elohim Adonai. Elohim Adonai. Elohim Adonai. Aliyah Fatene Karagata Asesila Paradana Sodak Yeretiata Felelanira Pantakaparo Davarate Periada Seli Tati Tatita You run, you run, you run. You run, you run, you run. for a moment tonight is a bible study it's a bible let's do ore fahalatana kalisa fratas teferidos karatana sanzali paparade zehila tatano sekatia farakata satai taita tetetino parakido satata rikapara tena oh Listen, brothers and sisters, South Africa is one of the leading nations for the next dispensation. The next order, the next order that is opening up globally, your country is at the forefront. This is why a new order of the ecclesia must rise. Church cannot just be received prophecy. Warriors must be born so that the church will have a voice. And hirelings will not lead a nation that has been given an inheritance. You will be exposed to truths that will bring out the ancient chronicles that were stored in your heart in the day you were fabricated in the studios of eternity. You ancient Zions, Hadosh, Hadosh. You are mighty on your throne. Oh. You see, witnesses, witnesses are already coming here from the heavens. Witnesses, carriers of divine oracles. I see beings with flames of fire. I see beings with scrolls, testimonies that are ancient. As they read them into your heart, metamorphosis will take place. Transfigurations, transfigurations will take place. Ushers, please help me. The three of them that comes under the fire now, bring them here. I, I, I'm seeing something, something being dropped on people. Like packets of fire, like packets. They are being littered on people across this place. Oh my God. Tehele. 
Shahita Patekara Radana Santa Kibai Perelete Savano Setika. I came here to blow a shofar over the nation because a new generation is about to be born. Custodians of secrets, carriers of dimensions, keepers of gates, watchers from the heavens, men that can pass laws and legislations and territories will open up for the move of the spirit. Sit down for a moment. Oh, Father. It's a burden. It's a burden. It looks like a hand is lifting people up, literally. As if ascensions, ascensions are taking place. Ascensions. He lifted up the beggar from the dung hill. He lifted. There's a lifting going on. Men that will stand to inherit thrones. To inherit scepters, to inherit dominions. Now, wherever you are standing, everyone numbered to carry the mandates of power. I decree by the Spirit, let that grace rest upon you now. Please sit down for a moment. What we come in this conference will be heavy. That's why I'm constraining myself. I must teach you this night. So that you know what to look out for. Because some of you will live here, you will glow like angels of light. I'm telling you. What eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, now has occurred to the heart of man. And so Jesus came to open up the dimensions of God so that we can look upon him and become that which God had in mind before he began the project of creation. And you see, when you look at that scripture in Genesis 1.26, God didn't create the man like an angel. There were many ranking angels in heaven. If you read the Bible and you see the credentials of angels, some of them will throw you into bewilderment. There are angels that when they stand on earth, their head will pierce through the cloud. One of their foot will cover the waters. One covers the whole earth. When they scream, the Bible says one third of the birds died. There are angels that can block the sun because of the rays that come out of them. There are ranking princes in Zion. Some of them are called dominions. Dominions are princes that have authority to rule over territories. Princes are rulers in the spirit that have authority to colonize territories. So when, it, when God wants to take over cities and territories, he sent princes and dominions, archangels. These are kinds of beings that are in the spirit. But he didn't create man like any of them. When he wanted to create us, he said, let us make man in our. Not even the image of one of the Godhead. He combined the dimensions of the Godhead. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. He said, let us make man. That was the glory that God had in mind. So that when we show up, the totality of God will be manifested through us. But they saw it in the Spirit, and there was a gang up. And the man was taught rebellion, and he fell from glory. And so God of necessity wanted to restore that glory. That's what Jesus looked when he hung on the cross naked. That this glory will not be lost. That it must manifest. And now that you have been born into the family of God, the law is that you must keep looking unto Jesus. Before I show you the effect of looking unto Jesus, let me show you quickly the stature of Christ so that you appreciate what you are about to be transfigured into. John chapter 1, verse 1. The Bible said, In the beginning, was the word. The first thing that you will see 
in the stature of Christ is that he was from the beginning. Now, when you read your Bible, there are four major beginnings in scriptures. Now, when we say beginning in the natural, the reference is origin. But now, when you are dealing with a realm that combines many realms, you know that the beginnings will be different. Because there's a beginning where time began. But there's a realm older than time. And so when you say beginning, what do you mean? You need to understand that in the spirit, beginning have stature. And so when he was talking here, he was talking about a dimension of beginning that there's none like. If you study Matthew 18 verse 9, when they gathered around Jesus and were debating about the subject of marriage, Jesus looked at them and said, you are bringing logic into spiritual things. He said, in the beginning it was not so. So there is a beginning where God gave ordinances and laws. So when we talk beginning in the spirit, there's a beginning where God began to give men laws, ordinances and instruction to guide them. But there is a beginning older than that because there was a realm where man was not yet created, where marriage had not even come into play. That's when you go to Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. It says in the beginning God created. So the beginning where ordinances are given is younger than the beginning where creation began. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then you now move to 1 John chapter 1 verse 1. And he began to speak about another beginning. He said that which was from the beginning, which we heard. So there's a beginning that is a testimony. There's a beginning that is a creation. There's a beginning that is a law and ordinance. The beginning where God gave law is the youngest beginning. Then the beginning where creation took place. Then the beginning where there was nothing but the testimony of the Christ. He said, we heard, we look, we now were brought into it to look upon and handle. And then there's a beginning that is a person. Where there's no activity but there's a being. So when John was saying, in the beginning was the word. He was talking about the oldest beginning. And that's why in this scripture, the totality of all beginnings were summarized. Creation was summarized here. He said he was with God. All things were made by him. So Genesis came from this beginning. In him was life. The testimony came from this beginning. And the life was the light of men. Ordinances came from this beginning. So when we are talking about the Christ, you need to understand that he's the oldest reality that can ever be. And so only in him does originality dwell. Because there's no counterfeit in that realm. So when God tells you to look on to Jesus, he's trying to ferry you through every region of counterfeit into originality as far as reality is concerned. And so a man who looks at Christ will carry a dimension that cannot be copied. And so there can be 10,000 apostles. Everyone has his unique voice. There can be 10,000 government officials. Everyone has his unique grace. There can be 10,000 businessmen. Everyone has his unique capacity. This is why in the kingdom, there's no basis for competition. You can't be me, I can't be you. Because when we went to the beginning, originality was what defined us. So when we say look unto Jesus, we are talking about the only one who has the authority for patent. He can make you an original of a dimension that cannot be counterfeited after many generations. This is not what money can buy. You can't find this anywhere. Not in the deepest of the depths of the ocean. It is where light himself dwells. So when we were invited, that's why the Bible said, blessed is the man that God causes to approach him. When the Bible invited us to look at him, he was bringing us to the foundations of originality. And trust me, if you are original, you are relevant. If you are original, you have value. If you are original, you must make impact. So the reason the glory can manifest is because the one we were invited to look onto is the originality of reality. Ah, in the beginning, and he said, was the world. And he said, the world was with God. And the world was God. So the one we are talking about is the one who has equal stature with God. And that's why the moment he mentioned that he was God, the next thing he said was that all things were made by him. 
That means the realm you have been invited into is a realm where lack is impossible. Because in case it does not exist, the one speaking is creator. So this is why the Bible said they looked up to him and their faces were radiant and they were not ashamed. So the things that are, he can make available to you. But in case they are not and your destiny requires it, he can create them and give them to you. There is no limitation in this realm. So we are talking about a people that carry a dimension of glory that makes them original. And by implication, when you touch them, you touch God. We are talking about a dimension of people that God wants to raise, that there's no lack in them. Even if they don't have it, it can be created. Even if it's not available, it can be made available because they are gazing into where creation itself dwells. He, in him, he said all things were created. We're talking about the stature of the one we have been invited to look up to. When we say Jesus is the glory and the beauty of God, you know what we are saying. The totality of the dimension of God that barnacles with him. He is the original. He is the creator of all things. This is why when we move, the ones we have, we thank him for it. The ones we don't have, we know we have it somewhere. When the time is right, it will come out. We don't need to carry everything to become a load. But at that instance where we need it, it will show up. See, a Christian has no business being depressed. When you need it, it will happen. The question is, who are you looking on to? Who are you looking on to? All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. That husband you are trusting God for, he can appear. That resources you are trusting God for, it can appear. That position you are trusting God for, even if there was none like that, it can be created. Because the one you are looking onto is the creator, the animator of reality. And they said in him was life. That means the substance of our being came from him. We have no essence without him. In him was life. You are not who you are because of what you are called. You are who you are because of the molecule of him that dwells in you. He is the substance of our being. Everything created, the Bible said he sustains all things by the word of his power. This is why even when it looks as if we will faint, something wakes up on our inside. Because there is a life that cannot be conquered that has been injected into our being. In him was life. Listen, brothers and sisters, there are three dimensions of life. There's the animal life. It is powered by the blood. The goat has it. The unbeliever has it. There is the soulish life. It's powered by breath. The Bible said in Leviticus 17:11, the life of the flesh is in the blood. The animal life. He said in Genesis 2, 7, God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and he became a living soul. The life of the soul is in the breath. That's why every man, when breath departs, he dies. But there's another life that is only for those who look unto Jesus. It's the spirit life. It's God's way. Only us carry it. The world thinks we are the same. When they gather, they say we are all men. We are not all men. Some of us, in addition to being men, we are called new creation. We manifest God, we showcase God, we reveal God, we carry God because we have both bios, suke, and zoe. Do you understand this? See, this is why when you go to the office, when men are applying principles, apply with them. When you go to school, if men are reading, read with them. But when you get to a level where reading does not work, when you go to a level where connection does not work, if you go to a level where principles does not work, then you turn to the heaven's frequency. After a while, headquarters, navigations, transmissions, transmissions, and then they look at you. They say, 10 men got to this spot. 
they died what happened why are you still standing in him was life the life was the light of man the light shined in the darkness the darkness comprehended it not everybody who came here was defeated how did you come out they looked up to him their faces were radiant they were not ashamed everybody who came here was frustrated why are you still sober greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world he said whoever is born of god overcome the world this is the victory that overcome the world even our faith we don't fall we are men fall we don't fail we are men fail because there's another life supporting our existence in him was life in him was life there is life in your blood every other creation have it there's life in your soul every other man has it but there's a life in your spirit that only you and those born of God have not everybody have it this is why we look up to him so that he can animate that life so that he can invigorate us through that life I'm talking about the stature when the Bible says look up to him the author and the finisher that means your starting and the guarantee of your finishing is a function of your connection to him every other thing is secondary there is a reason he has this cap the capacity he has the stature to be in that position and he said in him was life and he said the life was the light of man that is why the bible says we know more than our teachers they say you have an unction from the holy one and he said you know all things first john 2 20 and 27 he said you need that no man should teach you he said that unction teaches you all things even when you are in error he said you hear a voice behind you telling you he said turn this is the way to go you don't read that in the book that one is the light that comes out of your spirit because when it comes into you he becomes the illumination of your life and so you are precise even without your intelligence develop your intelligence as much as you can but there's a realm where precision comes beyond intelligence because that life is the light of men so if men don't look up to him they are doomed no matter how much they study because in the journey of life you will contend with men you will contend with the fallen world you will contend with demons and you will contend with principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. Your intelligence stop when you stop dealing with men. The moment you enter falling creation, you are dealing with realities that are older than the existence of man. The moment you deal with demons, you are dealing with realities that are wiser than the wisest of men. And the moment you deal with principalities and powers, you have come into a circuit of gods. Fallen beings that walk in the paradise of God. They have the secrets to the operations of the realm. They are wiser than you. The only way you can have an advantage is when you connect to the one who created them. That's why you become more ancient than they are. In him was life. And he said the life was the light of men. This is why we are invited to look up to him. He was in the beginning. He is God. He is creator. He is life. And he's the light of men. No being sits in that office. Only one sits there. His name is Jesus the Lord. Please sit down for a moment. Your hunger is much, so it's making it difficult for me to teach. <laughs> I saw that prayer investment has entered here deeply. Prayer has sunk here heavily. So it's, it's, it's interfering with my operations. 
Now, let's step down a little. I've done my introduction to show you the effect of looking, at, of looking onto him. This is where you appreciate it. Because listen, sometimes it becomes rugged to look up to him. There are times when battles will come because you decided to choose Jesus. If you don't know the effect of looking up to him, there will be no justification for that action when the going gets tough. This is why you need to understand this and work with it. Because you will fight and you will, it will appear as though you are defeated before the excellency of looking unto him begins to manifest. If you don't know why you must look up to him, if you don't understand the effect of looking unto him, when the chips are down, you will compromise. Meanwhile, the night comes before the light. The people who wait for the light are those who understand the realities, the effect of staying with him. They know that come what may, they will not be defeated. What are the effects of looking up to this great being of stature? I'll give you five quickly. Number one, when you look up to him, it brings salvation into your realm. It brings salvation into your ecosystem. It brings salvation into your world. It brings you into the experience of salvation. And please don't be quick to assume what I mean by salvation. Because this salvation has many layers. You know, the Bible said, <laughs> you can be set free and you can be made free. They are two different things. The salvation that entails making has layers. That's why even after you are saved and you receive eternal life, you still keep looking onto him. Because there are different depths to salvation. And I will show you five dimensions of salvation that it brings to you in addition to the eternal life that he gave you. An exoneration from judgment. I know we know that. The eternal life and the exoneration from eternal judgment. But there are other layers of salvation that gives you victory in this world. Before you are transited to glory. All of those salvation are tied into looking up to him. In John chapter 1 verse 29. The moment he appeared. John gave us the first syllabus. What happens when a man looks up to this being? He said, the next day, John seared Jesus coming unto him and said, behold. That means this salvation is only available to those who behold. Behold. The word behold means become aware. Others may see him as a carpenter. He said, but you become aware that this is the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Become aware. That means see him differently. See him as the custodian of salvation. Don't see him as a Jew. There are many who are still seeing him as their brother. And they have never received salvation. He said, but you become aware that this is the custodian of salvation. So the first way to see him is to see him with understanding that in him is the embodiment of salvation. Because that's the effect of beholding him. And there's salvation in none other but him. That's what Peter told us. He said there's no salvation anywhere else. Sometimes I pray and pity other religions. Because they think by penance they can be saved or they may be saved. Meanwhile, everyone who pioneered all those religions died in uncertainty. And they are hoping that one day they will be saved. Respectfully speaking, not looking down on any other. But Jesus himself said, I am the way. He didn't say, I am a. I am the. I am the way. Peter said, there is no salvation in any other. There are no other means of routing salvation. Even those who died before him, the Bible said he preached to them in hell. Because he's the only gateway to the Father. And so the Bible is teaching us here that looking unto Jesus is not to belong to a religious sect. It's to come to acknowledgement that this one carries my eternity. This one carries the hope of my eternal destination. 
If I don't connect to him, I am doomed, regardless of what I do. No meditation, no sacrifice. I've taught my people several times, spirits don't forgive. There's no spirit that has the capacity to forgive. The realm of spirit is the realm of judgment and retribution. The wages of sin is death. And the whole of humanity is falling. So everyone will die except one who has the stature dies in their place. And so God did not forgive us in the sense of saying, just go, I pardon you. Nothing like that exists in the realm. There are two things that sponsors forgiveness, expiation and propitiation. Propitiation is to take the penalty for an offense. So when he was crushed on the cross, the anger of God was transferred to him. And so every one of us who looks up to him, God calculates it logically that we were in him when he was being crushed. And so when he crushed him, he crushed us. So if there is no sacrifice, substitutionary sacrifice, Pascal sacrifice, there can be no forgiveness. And after he was crushed, the blood that is spilled, he took it to the tabernacle of heaven and presented it as a testimony. So our sins were wiped away. That's what you call expiation. So forgiveness is possible because the anger of God was already transferred to him on the cross and your sins were washed by his blood. So only Jesus had the capacity to produce both expiation and propitiation. So anybody who accepts him accepts the, the exoneration that comes to those that he paid the price on the account. And when you do that, the proof that you have been included into this transaction is that eternal life is credited into your spirit. And when you receive eternal life, the Holy Ghost is deposited into you as the insurance that when he returns, you will be raptured with him. So if we don't have Jesus to look up to as the savior of the world, then we are doomed. Because there's nothing we can do to pay for our sins. He's the only one who has that capacity. Sinless, pure in every sense. And he has the, stat the stature to pay for everyone. He's the only one. And so when you look at him or look unto him, the first implication is that salvation comes to you. John 3, 14 and 15. The Bible said, As Moses lifted up the brazen serpent in the wilderness, it says, so also the Son of Man shall be lifted up. And it says, whoever looks up to him shall be saved. This was the premise upon which John 3.16 was written. It said, therefore, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Because he was that symbol of salvation that was presented to the world. That's why John called him the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world that take it away and so the first effect of looking unto him is that you become guaranteed of salvation and when you are given eternal life then the life begins to work out the five tributaries of salvation in you because there are five things we're delivered from number one is Satan number two is death. Number three is the world. Number four is sin. And number five is flesh. When life comes into you, there's a protocol that life activates to deliver you from these five things. You know, Paul, after receiving Christ, thought that the job had ended. And he discovered he was struggling with flesh. He was struggling with sin. And so if you read Romans chapter 7 from verse 18, to Romans 8 verse 5, we are going to see how Paul came out into absolute salvation. He said, I discovered that this issue of sin and defeat is not a real thing. He said, there are laws. When man fell, a law was introduced into his soul. And he said, that law is the law of sin and death. He said, there is a law that God originally put in him, which is the law of the mind. He said, that law is what prompts sin to do the will of God. He said, but he discovered that there's another law in his members. That every time he wants to do the will of God, that law negates him. So the law of the mind wants him to live holy. 
the law of the man wants him to serve God. But every time he attempts it, the law of sin and death counters it. And a point came, the great apostle Paul said, Oh, wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of sin? He said, there are two laws dominating my life. And he now said, he discovered something. That those who are in Christ, there is a third law that is introduced to them. That's why I said, there is therefore no condemnation for them that are in Christ Jesus. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. That means when you find this new law, you have to cooperate with it. And he said, that law is in the life that was credited to us. He said, the law of the spirit of life that is in Christ Jesus have set me free from the law of sin and death. So the reason he's able to serve God now and walk in liberty is because the third law that life produces has countered the law of sin and death. And so when you look at Jesus and salvation is given to you, everything that enslaves you is destroyed, beginning from Satan. And why is there a justification for it? When he was on the cross in Colossians 2.14, the Bible said, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a public show of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So when he defeated Satan, that defeat and that victory he secured was completed into life. And that's not all. Jesus himself speaking, he said, be of good courage, I have overcome the world. So when he was walking in this world and sin couldn't dominate him, he was fighting to defeat the world. And he said, but be of good courage. I have overcome the world. He said, my peace I give you. So the victory that he secured over the world was credited into life. Now, he came with eternal life to give you, which is able to separate you from God's judgment, which is able to make you a member of the family of God. But before he transferred that eternal life, he was enriching it. He put victory over Satan inside that life. He put victory over the world inside that life. And he didn't stop there. Even sin could not find dominion over him. The Bible said in him was no guy. It said there was no sin found in him. So he defeated sin and credited it into that life. And he didn't stop there. Even the world system could not dominate him. Satan came to him and said, bow to me, I'll give you the word and the glory thereof. He looked at him and laughed. This is not my master. I have conquered this. And he put it inside that life. And then even the flesh, the power over the flesh, Jesus ruled over it. The spirit is weak, willing, but the flesh is weak. But he travelled in Gethsemane until he defeated the flesh. When he conquered these five things, he credited the victory into eternal life. And so when he rose up and came to us, he deposited all of that into us. That's why the Bible told us clearly, sin shall no longer have dominion over you because sin has been conquered. That's why he told us, in my name, cast out devils. That means Satan has no dominion over you. That's why he told us, him that believeth in me shall not die. He said he has passed from death to life because death has been conquered. That's why he told us, if this, the spirit wrestles against the flesh, the flesh against the spirit, the two are one to another. He said, but if you are spiritually minded, you will overcome the flesh. All of the things that would have made you a, a victim was credited into eternal life. And the law of the spirit of life begins to work out that protocol in you. And he said, the way that law is strengthened is for you to be spiritually minded. That's why you come for conferences like this. To be reminded that you are not a man of the flesh. That you are born of God. To be reminded that sin has no dominion over you. We are trying to make you spiritually minded so that life can be empowered. But all of this is a function of what? Looking unto him. When you look unto him, salvation is deposited in you through the economy of life. The second effect of looking unto him, there are deeper things, but it's tomorrow I will go there. Because tomorrow is revival. <laughs> and we will, we will bring judgment over serpentine spirits. I came here, it was not up to four hours. They came to my room. I just laid down to take a nap. And I saw a goddess came trying to seduce me. And I knew that there were powers in the, in the region. The powers that dethroned the mighty. They wanted to, to subjugate my testimony. Less than four hours. If I don't teach you how to war against the flesh, 
you can't fulfill destiny. You think it's normal for every girl to want to be naked? There's an intelligence manipulating. It's called the world. And when we got the victory, the Bible says, love not the world. This is not legalism. This is a protocol that introduces seduction into the soul. So that you become a medium in the hand of territorial spirit. I will show you how territorial spirit recruit agents. And some of you have used your bodies as theaters to dethrone mighty men. You don't know that you are more active than demons. Go and study. There are only three categories of people that love appearing naked. Number one is children. Number two is prostitute. Number three is demon possessed. The only time you can be innocent, be naked, is if you are a baby. And if you are a baby, your powers have not developed. That's why it's excusable. If you mature and you expose yourself, you are either a harlot or you are demon possessed. The moment somebody is possessed, he start tearing the shirt. That's one of the, I'm telling you, but those are the powers that have walked through this land so that the mighty cannot rise. Who told you your value is in exposing your church? The Bible says Christ in you is the hope of glory. It said we have this treasure in earthen vessel. When angels were created, their treasure was put on them. When men were created, their treasures were put inside them. Anything that makes you feel you must expose yourself to be relevant has taken you back to the fall. And he has made you a slave. But tomorrow we will bring judgment so we will address some things. <laughs> what God wants to do in this territory is heavy. And so he wants to, the devil wants to introduce foreign practices so that they will become channels through which the sons and the daughters of the land will not fulfill their destiny. But this conference came to say no. Your horn must be exalted. Your horn must be exalted. Is there a stopwatch? <laughs> I, I, I want to manage myself. When it's five minutes and we are sent. So I, I want to manage. Okay, they've given me an expo. The second effect of looking up to Jesus is that he utters your faith and he finishes it. Now, there are two dimensions or the expressions of faith if you study the Bible. There is a dimension of faith that began with Abraham and ended before Christ came. If you read Romans chapter 4 from verse 1, you are going to see where Paul was talking about this faith. He said, what did Abraham our father according to the flesh found? And he began to expose us to the things Abraham found. And he showed us that what Abraham found was a type of faith. He said, Abraham believed God. And it was counted to him for righteousness. And he went down to show us the travail of Abraham in entering into that economy. The Bible said from verse 18, who against hope believed in hope that he will become the father of many nations. And the Bible said he staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief, but he was strong in faith, giving glory to God. So the dimension of faith Abraham found was to depend on God to produce answers. Now that faith is important. That's where every one of us begin from. But Jesus now came and jacked the bar of faith higher. And in Mark 11:22, the Bible now told us, have the God kind of faith. And he told us, what is this God kind of faith? He said, there's a mountain before you. Don't talk to God about it and wait for God to answer. He said, you address the mountain. Because now you have become the representation of God. When you talk, they hear God. The voice of God is now in you. He said, in the days of Abraham, they will speak to the mountain and wait for God to move it. He said, in this God kind of faith, you talk to the mountain and the mountain move if you don't doubt in your heart. So Jesus came to jack up our faith to a level. But this type of faith, you don't learn it. This type of faith comes to you. In Romans 10, 17, he said, this faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In Romans 12, verse 3, he said, God dealt unto us the measure of faith. So this type of faith, when you accepted Christ, it was credited into your spirit. Now, the more you look at Christ, the more that faith is empowered. 
the more that faith is strengthened. That's the faith Paul spoke about in 2 Corinthians 4.13. He said, according as it is written, he said, they believe and have spoken. He said, we having the same spirit of faith, believe and therefore we speak. And he went to Galatians 2.20. He said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. He said, the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. The faith of the Son of God. So every one of us who accepted Christ, we don't have the problem of faith anymore. Our problem is a problem of understanding. Because right now, the measure of faith you require was credited into you. But the thing is, that faith works by a protocol. What is the protocol? Consciousness and declaration. If you are not conscious and if you don't proclaim, it will not happen. Because Jesus said, when there's a mountain before you, you must remember that when you stand before that mountain, God is standing there. God is not sending an angel there. God is not appearing like a cloud. When they see you, they see him. When they hear you, they hear him. Luke 10, 16, the Bible said, him that hears you, hears me. So when you talk to that mountain, that mountain will hear the voice of God. So your job is to become conscious that when I show up, God shows up. When I come, God comes. That's why the Bible said, now are we ambassadors of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. Now are we the ambassadors of Christ. The ambassador talks on the behalf of the president. But see the problem of the believer. The Holy Ghost knows that he will confront a mountain tomorrow and his faith is weak. And the Holy Ghost shoots a scripture into his heart. Meditate on that scripture overnight. But he went watching movies. When he confronts that mountain, that scripture is what is supposed to jump out. But he never chewed it. So when he comes there, he's standing and saying, Lord, where are you? Lord, are you alive? And God said, ah, I mean you. When you showed up, I showed up. You are the one they see to see me. You carry my image. You embody my dimension. But the problem is that when the word came, he didn't catch it. This is why in the New Testament, one of our preoccupations is to catalambano. Any signal in the spirit we catch. Sometimes you are even sleeping and God shows you a trance. And in that trance, you went into that business. And when people were talking, you saw yourself, you kept quiet. When everybody was done talking, you made one sentence and it changed everything. The next day you go for that meeting and then you see the same setting. Because God is teaching you how to practice being godly. He's teaching you how to manifest God. Because you are not going there to cry and say, where are you? So he's teaching you the way that the reality will manifest. There are times when there is a, 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 a meeting or an engagement in two days time. The Holy Ghost comes ahead and says, the energy level where you should talk from is a bit higher than where you are. Take a 24 hours fast and pray in tongues for six hours. What is he teaching you? To practice divinity. To practice. You know the way Peter calls it? He said, according as his divine power. Second Peter 1 verse 3. He said, he has given us all things that pertains to life and godliness. He said, but it's through the epignosis, the experiential knowledge of them that he has called to glory and virtue. He said, because he wants us to escape the corruption that is in the world through loss, he made us partakers of his divine nature. So everything God would have wanted to do, God credits into you and sends you and say, go there on my account. The job of the Holy Ghost is to make you prepared enough to represent God. And sometimes the Holy Ghost comes ahead and says, take a three days fast. If you take a three days fast, when you reach there, the word will come out. You don't need to meditate. Just show up, open your mouth. But you need a height. There is a height where you will talk from. It's a reality of the ascended order. But it will take you three days fast to be able to mount up. Did you not read your Bible? It said, they that wait upon the Lord, they renew their strength. It said, they mount up with wings. They mount up. See, there's a realm where we talk from. There are things when you talk at the natural, but there are other things that only when your wings come can you speak. If your wings have not appeared, you can't talk. Because the set of walls are in the, in the heavens. This is why we don't know. We need to learn Jesus. The Bible said in Mark 1 35, in the cool of the day, he went to a solitary place. When he's done praying, he enters the market. They bring the deaf, he say open. They bring the blind, he say open. It's not about open, it's where he's talking from. He sent his disciples out. They cast out devils. Matthew 10. 
Matthew 17, they brought another demon possessed. They didn't know that they needed to go. And they were there laboring. The man who brought his son was offended. He said, I brought my son here. Your disciples, they could not cast him out. They suffered that public ridicule. Not because the capacity was not there, but they were not ascended. But the Jesus who came from the mountain showed up and said, out of him. You know, when he went to the mountain, that's when the disciples knew what happens on the mountain. They say, as he prayed, they said the fashion of his countenance was altered. Glory is renewed. Authority is renewed. Dimensions are renewed. And so when he shows up, the demons see God, not man. The problem with you is that you have been given the faith of the Son of God, but you have violated the protocol. Sometimes you are talking with your friends. Conversation is exceeding 30 minutes. You start losing your peace. You know this is time to stop. Energy. You are effusing too much energy. You are releasing too much power. It's time to stop. It's time to stop. Sometimes you now feel guilty. You, it's the faith in you walking. The faith of the Son of God. You have exhausted bandwidth. Go for refilling. But you talk and talk away energy. And the moment you reach home, somebody is conversing. And then you go and carry dry scriptures. In the name of Jesus, get up. You don't know that when we talk, virtue must flow. The Bible said they touched him and virtue went out of him and healed them all. This faith works with virtue. You must generate virtue for your words to carry power. That's why the Bible says he's the author and the finisher. He gives you the faith and he teaches you what to do for the faith to produce results. It's called the operation of the faith of the Son of God. And unfortunately, even pastors, most of them don't operate here. Meanwhile, go and check those who are herbalists. They know how to manage what they carry in their spirit. They know how to manage it. There are many sorcerers that don't see the sun for six months every year so that they can conjure sufficient energy to alter the outcome of a nation. And so they can enter their room in January and come out in July. And when they cross a land, it remains like that for another cycle. Because they know what to do to harness energy in darkness pay prices to carry essence of, of demonic power so that when they come out, if they talk, their voice is like the, the communication of a thousand princes. But you who God dwells on your inside, you are deflated and you come talking from a lifeless realm. Every one of us carry the faith of the Son of God. The problem is that very few are operating in it. Oh, and when you start growing, you will discover that that faith is sensitive to certain appetites. For some, it's worship only. Every time you worship, you are child. You can't see any impossibility. When you come out, they tell you something is impossible. What you are seeing is a testimony. They tell you this guy is about to die. The next thing you see a vision of him testifying on Sunday. So when men are seeing death, you have gone too high. Where you are seen from, there's no death. You are seeing him testifying. And they won't know what is happening. You have submitted to the finisher. He has taught you how to walk that faith. And so when you are singing, you are not practicing. You are not tuning your voice. When you are singing, you are ascending. You can be washing and singing, cooking and singing. And the point will come when you will hit a crescendo where you have not entered before. And you will be arrested. Because new angels, you have come into the cycle of new angels. And for a while you will be there. It's an encounter. And you will need to grow in it. A point comes when you grow in it until it becomes a radar. When you come into a place, because you are present, things happen. The Bible spoke concerning Samuel. When he sat in Nayot in Rama, anybody who entered that radar came under his influence. He didn't need to talk anymore. That faith had become an atmosphere. And he could change things by the power of that atmosphere. Imagine what will happen if five of us here begin to manifest our dimension. I tell you, South Africa is too small. And because the devil knows how this works, he preoccupies us with distractions. He preoccupies us with iniquity. He preoccupies us with things that diffuse us. And so, you know, somebody can do 21 days fast, three hours, he diffuses it. Either with gossip, or with malice, or with a movie, or he just diffuses, and he feels it that is empty. Because your, your conscience is like a radar. It shows you where your battery level is. 
If a powerful generation will rise, we must understand the organic operations of spirit life. And you need to know that you have the faith of the Son of God and that faith is operated by the Holy Ghost. He will give you operational modalities to stay afloat so that when you talk, your voice can become like the voice of God. This is what the prophets of old knew. They say holy men of God spake as they were moved. They knew when God moved them. They were moved into fasting, moved into prayer, moved into waiting, moved into worship. And when they came out, they came out like gods walking among men. I prophesy to you, a generation that manifests the faith of the Son of God will emerge from this conference. Hmm. Let me just list the remaining three. Go and study it so that we'll worship. You know, these things are not just a message, they are a body. You know, the, the office of the apostle makes you teach not what you read. We read, but most of our messages come from our encounters and our processes with God so that we can talk life, not just give you syllables to read. I'm telling you what I share with you tonight, they are echoes and impartations into your dimension. Most of you will leave this conference, you will discover that in another three weeks, you will speak to bones and they will straighten. You will speak and circumstances will be altered. Because for some of you, these walls will take sleep from you. And night times will become moments of intimacy. Some of you, these walls will bring you into the corridor of fasting. And as you leave this conference, appetite for food will die until the spirit man is born through process and you will discover that locked into you are dimensions of Christ that a generation have not seen I'm telling you most times we celebrate what we see the best of God is not behind it's ahead everything we have seen including the one talking to you here is nothing compared to what is yet to be seen some of you sitting here you carry graces and dimensions that can liberate South Africa in one year in one month, some even in one week, you will talk and mobilizations will happen that will change the foundation of the land. But do you know how to look on to him? When he shows up at night, can you defy sleep? When you plan a banquet and it comes with a protocol of fasting, can you shut down the kitchen and say there is a journey that I must embark on? Because this is the way of sons. We travel with Elohim until he teaches us the oracles of his spirit so that we can manifest him in his brightest colors. Because our manifestation is what the hope of a generation depends on. He said the earnest expectation of the creation. He waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. Why do we look unto Jesus? We look unto him because he brings salvation to us. Why do we look unto Jesus? We look unto him because he alters our faith and he finishes it. See, most of you, when this conference is over, listen, I'm talking to the leaders of South Africa. See, a new South Africa is coming with new set of leaders, with new ranking in the spirit. I'm showing you what you have in order to confront the beast of the land. The same beast that made your fathers to compromise. The reason you will come into power and you'll be able to stand where some of the fathers fell is because you have learned this truth. Africa is in danger because most of our fathers compromised. There are presidents, senators, and governors that sold 50 years of a nation and of a territory. So even if you are a good leader and you come into power, the land has been sold. There's nothing you can do. There are fathers that went, to, and we are, we are very excellent fathers. I honor fathers. I quote them. I revere them. But I'm not talking about the few handful that are still beaming the torch. I'm talking about the majority that betrayed us. There are certain nations today you enter, you are a suspect on arrival. Because those who went ahead of you, they sold your inheritance. If a new generation will rise, that can speak at the gate, they must come with new weapons. So when I talk to you, I talk to you like myself, the leaders of the new world that is coming. And there are powers that we must carry. 
to be able to bring emancipation to Jacob. Number three, sit down for a moment. I'm rounding up. Please write these things down. Study around it. Make sure beyond piety in church that you are truly saved. Saved from sin. Saved from the world. Saved from flesh. Saved from death. Saved from demons. Make sure. Fight through prayer, meditation, through mentorship. Submit to the tutelage of the spirit. It's beyond dressing well and acting pious. Church cliche is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about men that have a signature in the spirit. That the princes know that these ones are light. Make sure you are saved indeed. So that when the next world opens, you have your place. And make sure that you function by the faith of the Son of God. See, the Holy Ghost will train you. Oh, there are times when all the money you have, he will tell you to give it. And you will give it for one year. There will be no give. It shall be given unto you. He is teaching you how to die to mammon. Because the reason many fell where princes were tested is because they serve two masters. So for you, giving is not, if you give a car, you have a company. All of those things can happen. Give is given unto his read. God's servant gave us a thorough exposition. But in the school of process, give, it shall be given unto you, can become teaching you worship. Because when Abraham gave Isaac, he called it worship. That's how stature is born. Give can become love for God. That's how God tests your love. He said, where a man's treasure is, that's where his heart is. So he's trying to bargain your heart. Give can become an act of honor. Honor the love with your substance. Because there's a level of honor you will enter before the powers of the ages to come is committed to you. And God will carry you through that process. Sometimes three years, you give and keep giving. But one day, you will rise up as his prince. And then men will wonder, why did God entrust so much power to this young girl? She's young in age, but she's ancient in spirit. Where, to, where she has traveled to, only few reach there. Why is this old man still relevant? He's old in the flesh, but in the spirit he's current with God. He knows the present emphasis and he keeps walking. Make sure he finishes your faith. Because God is in need of men. And I see some of those men and women here in this conference. Number three. I'm just listing now. Why do we look up to him? We look up to him for strength and for guidance. Our world is too noisy. The only compass for navigation is the voice of God. And the only thing that will truly strengthen you is the strength of His Spirit. When you look away, you will sink. If you study your scriptures, Matthew 14, 29 to 31, Peter saw him walking on water and said, if it be thou, bid me come. He said, come. He was walking until he looked away. And he began to sink in God's presence. So, the presence of God alone is not enough. Where your gaze is, is important. Because Peter sank in his presence. That's why you attend Holy Ghost service. You are still sinking. And you are wondering, what's going on? There's no gaze. You are looking here and there. And when you don't, your strength is depleted. And so a generation that will be strong is a generation that looks up to him. Looking up to him to be discipled, to be taught his ways. He said, come unto me, all ye that labor. And a heavy land. You see, and I will what? Give you rest. That's a place of dominion. Where nothing conquers you anymore. You are strong as a thousand men. Because he has taught you his ways. He has carried you through his process. He put strength on your life. And like Paul, your testimony will be that I too can do all things. Through Christ, we strengthen me. The reason we look up to him is so that when our strength fails us, his strength can activate us so that nothing can defeat us. He said, they that wait upon the Lord, he said, they mount up with wings like the eagle. He said, when they walk, they are not weary, and when they run, they don't faint. That means they have passed 
the frailty of humanity. They have entered into a realm where they are sufficed by the powers of Elohim. This is not something that youthfulness can procure. Because if you read that scripture from verse 28, Isaiah 40, he said, have you not heard? Has it not been told to you that the everlasting God fainted not? Neither is he weary. He said, he giveth power to the faint, and unto them that have no might, he increases strength. He said, but in case you think you don't need it, let me tell you ahead of time, even the youth shall be weary. And he said, the young men shall utterly fall. This race is with spirits. That you are strong in the gym does not mean you'll be strong in the journey of spirit life. The only people who can be strong, he says, they that wait upon the Lord. There's a way he mantles them. So we look up to him for strength and for direction. Number four, why do we look up to him? So that we can learn his character and imbibe his virtues. The power that God is giving to us will require virtue as a boundary and a checker to allow us to walk in it. Do you know the dimension of power you will carry that when you talk, a president can be dethroned? You cannot afford ego. That's why people who are proud are bluffs. They don't know God's power. When God gives you power, he will insist on virtue. In fact, before he gives you real power, he will insist on virtue. So the reason we look up to him is to learn his examples. The Bible said in Philippians chapter 2 from verse 5, it said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. Although he was, with, was equal with God, he did not cleave to that privilege. Rather, he stripped himself of the garment of divinity and he accepted to become a man. And even among men, he was like a slave and died the death of a criminal. And the Bible said, because of this virtue, he said, God gave him a name that is above every other name. He was named before Jesus. Now, Lord has been added. At the name of Jesus, every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So, as Jesus the Savior, that was a function of his DNA as God. But as Jesus the Lord, that was a function of his virtues. If you don't carry that virtue, you can't manifest his essence. If you want to wield the real power that we speak of today, you must carry the virtues of God. Let this mind be in you. So the reason we look at him is so that no matter how high God takes us, we remember that our master was higher, yet he was humble. In John 13, from verse 13 to 15, the Bible said, Jesus speaking to them now, he said, you call me Lord and master. On your light, on the light of your phone, illuminate the place with your phone. Nothing can stop us. This night, you must enter something. He said, you call me Lord and master. He said, you do well because I am so. He said, but learn this lesson. Your Lord and your master is washing your feet. He said, the greatest of you must do likewise. So the reason we look up to Jesus is so that we can handle the glory and the power that he's bringing to us. If we don't look at his example, the day you, God opens one blind eye through you, you will become insolent. The day God gives you a land, the world don't hear. Meanwhile, God wants to give you a nation. But he gave you one hectare of land, you, think you, have, you thought you have arrived. And your arrogance will make you lose the nation. The day God gives you opportunity to talk to a counselor or a coordinator in a province, you will rise up and say, we rule the nation. <laughs> Meanwhile, God is bringing you to a point to mentor presidents. But now you have shown him that you don't have the capacity to be the father of a president. So he will shift it to another person who has passed the test of alignment. And so for you to reach where God is taking you, it's not just prayer and fasting. Consecration is important, but virtue is the guarantee. If you don't imbibe the virtues of Christ, there are many things God will risk giving you because it will cost you your salvation. And because he loves you more than what he does through you, he will withdraw some of the things he would have given you so that he can keep you. The reason many remain small is because they don't have the virtue to accommodate it. You can see what God is doing through God's servant and you come and you say, what, what message are they preaching? And you can learn everything if your heart is not humble. If there's no love, if there's no compassion, if there's no fear of God, apply everything they are applying. You even do it better, but you cannot have the authority that he has. Because there are dimensions that revelation gives you, there are dimensions that consecration gives you, and there are other dimensions that only virtue will give you. If you want to be complete, have revelation, have consecration, have virtue. This is why we look on to Jesus. Jesus was the word. 
He beamed the totality of God's revelation and he carried the highest consecration from prayer to fasting to giving everyone he had. Yet, he was humble. The Bible says when they revived him, he revived not. They slapped him, he turned the other side. He told Peter, I have the power to call a legion now. He said, but I must do what God wants. He went to John's baptismal service. He wanted to be baptized. John said, no, I know you. You are the Lamb of God. He said, suffer it to be so for now. Thus, it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. You, somebody mistakenly introduces you wrongly. And you keep malice for six months. And you say you want to wield power. Somebody greets you, he doesn't add, sir. You look at him, he say. Because he doesn't add, sir. Too full of yourself. And now that you are full, you don't need any addition. So God will withdraw the one he has. Every time you look at Jesus, he humbles you. Every time you look at Jesus, he breaks you. That the creator is baptized by creation. There's no justification. The one you created is laying hands on you and baptizing you. There's no justification. That the one who could breathe and humanity will vanish, hung on the cross naked. There's no justification. So when we look at him, he reveals to us that we must never be full of ourselves. Our focus is to continue emptying. Listen, if they will dishonor you, let them dishonor you. The best thing you can do is avoid them. Don't pick a quarrel because somebody dishonored you. The one who dishonored you lost what he should have received from you. Because the law is that without every contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. So you who is dishonored, you are not the one that lost. It's the one who dishonored you that lost. And if you will not repent, leave him. After many years, he will learn his folly. Finally, as I round up, we look up to him so that we are transformed and conformed into his image. Because what God wants to produce is for many who carry Christ to walk through the earth. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. That's my last scripture. The Bible says, Him that he foreknew, he predestinated to be conformed to the image of the Son, so that he might be what? The firstborn amongst many brethren. The Jesus project is a revelation that God can dwell in flesh. He said, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. And in verse 14 of John 1, he said, and the word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The project of Jesus is to show us that God can dwell in flesh. So that in the day that he resurrects, he can now tabernacle on our inside. Because we saw it in him, our faith can carry it. So when I say God lives in me, I'm able to believe it because I've seen a prototype in Christ. And so the focus of God is for you and I to interact with the God on our inside until we become like him. That's why I say we all with open faces, beholding us in a glass, the glory of the Lord, we are metamorphosed. When we are metamorphosed, we come into the image of Christ so that you can become an extension of the Christ that the Bible speaks of. And so now, the Holy Ghost, the Father, the Word, and the Bible are not the only witnesses. You and I have become witnesses because we can demonstrate God. He said, not many days from now you shall receive the Holy Ghost and power. And he said, you shall be witnesses. The same way the scripture produces witness you too can now produce witness. That's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he said, be a followers of me as I'm the follower of Christ. John said as he is, so are we in this world. And so when we come to that point of confirmation, you will now see that the same anointing that was manifesting through Christ will manifest through you. Because God anointed him with the Holy Ghost and power. Acts 10, 38. We too were anointed with the Holy Ghost and power. Acts 1, 8. The life that he had is the life that you and I also have. In 1 John 5, 11, he said, this is the record. He said, God has given us eternal life. He said, this life is in the Son. He said, whoever has the Son has life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have life. So when you show up, they touch Jesus' anointing. They touch Jesus' life. They touch Jesus' faith. You have the faith of the Son of God. And then you carry the mind of Christ. 
The Bible says we have not received the spirit that is of this world. It says we have received the spirit that is of God, and so we know the things that are freely given to us by God. It says with things we speak, not with words that human wisdom teaches. It says with words that the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. It says, but the natural man is even not the things of the Spirit of God. Neither can he know them. He said they are spiritually discerned. He said, but for you and I, he said, we have the mind of Christ. When you are conformed, you will operate at the frequency of Christ. And people will look at you and say, what school did you go to? What course did you read? And then you tell them, I went to school, I read. But what is operating through me is the voice of an ancient spirit. That's when you become the light of your world. Because he called himself light. And he also called you light. Tonight, God has given us an introduction of that which he wants to do. A generation that will reflect Christ. We look up to him so that we can reflect him. I don't know the dimension that you carry. But let this conference not end until you find yours. Because when you walk out of this meeting, Christ must be seen through your life. That's the errand of God. And that is the purpose and the message of this conference. Can we rise up to our feet in the next five minutes? No, in the next two minutes. Ah, ah, ah. Ah, ah, ah. Ah, ah, ah. Ah, ah, ah. I want you to pray for one minute. Dimension that you have bequeathed me, cause it to manifest from this encounter. Aye. 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 Let me show you something. You know, I deliberately stepped down the service so that I can complete my circuit. And so that you know why this conference was stacked the way it was stacked. One of the dimensions God gave me is the ability to set men on fire. I can charge the service, I can keep it calm. The same thing will happen. Because it is what he gave me. Another dimension he gave me is to heal the sick. I'm telling you. And I want to show you something so that you will know. You know, what God is giving us is not for church service. It's in the market. It's in the office. There will be no keyboard there. There will be no choir to support we worship. You need to be able to call to heaven and it appears. That's how you bring government. Another thing he gave me is speed. Oh. Huh. If I share testimonies with you, you won't believe it. What takes some 20 years, sometimes we do in one year. From the place of rest, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, a speed that's making me stand here. By the mercy of God, these are not my mates, they are my elders. But when God brings something to you by mercy, He facilitates it. I want God to credit some of those dimensions to those who carry the same. Can you lift your hand? All you need to do for me is to tell God, I am ready. It will ignite it now, but you may run with it for the next three years. It will ignite it. 
The first thing that God will do is to put fire on people. Fire. Raw revival fire. You will live here, you will not be able to sleep. You will be praying till daybreak. You will fast for months. You will study. And that energy will eat you up from inside. Father, wherever they are standing, I speak as a witness of fire. Holy Ghost, every heart open. I decree and declare now. Touch! Touch! Ushers, help me. Touch! The fire that burns in the bone. The fires of revival. Holy Ghost! Help them, help them, help them. I have two minutes. Aliyah! Have those of them been touched now? I will make one declaration for those who came here with tumors, eye conditions, and bone conditions. God will heal them now. Hmm. Sir, I was in UK two weeks ago. When I finished teaching them like this, I made a declaration a lady came with her x-ray scan. Her bone was bent like this. This is on screen, not uh, it happened in the bush somewhere. Bone was curved like this with scan. She has never stood straight. When she stands, she stands bent with a lot of pain. In that service, God straightened her like this. She stood straight for the first time. No, nobody was shouting. If God gives you, he gives you. Your job is to grow into it. Some of you will, te will testify that until this conference is over, you can't eat again. You won't know why. But a flame will be kindled. Some of you will lie on your bed praying in tongues till daybreak. It's a fire. Before I speak over the sick, if you are listening to me now, and you have not publicly made Jesus the Lord of your life, we are not talking to you. You are making a mistake to assume we are talking to you. This is the heritage of the saints in light. We are not referring to you at all. But this is your opportunity. The Bible says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you'll be saved. And it says if you declare him publicly, he will also declare you before his father. If you are standing here, before I pray for the sick now, I have just about two minutes, and you have not publicly declared Jesus as your Lord, lift your right hand. I want to lead you to Christ now. This is your opportunity. I know it's a believer's convention, but I also know there's somebody that needs to surrender to Jesus completely today. Lift that hand boldly. I can see some hands. Lift them. If your hand is lifted, run to the front here. This is your service. Clap for them, clap for them. Come quickly, come quickly. Ah, hey, ah, hey. Hey, hey, ah. Ah, ah, ah.
you come in. This is your service. The conference will become brutal from tomorrow. We just needed to do introduction so that you understand where we are going. Give God a big hand for his children. The Bible says if you believe with your heart and confess with your mouth, you are saved. Place your right hand on your chest as a mark of surrender. Come quickly, brother. Come quickly. Say, dear Heavenly Father, I believe with all my heart that Jesus is your son. I believe he died for my sins. I believe he was buried. And on the third day, he rose from the dead for my justification. I confess with my mouth that this same Jesus from this moment is my Lord and my Savior. I receive eternal life into my spirit. I am born again. Thank you, Father, for receiving me into the family of God. In Jesus' name, I have declared. Lord, keep them by the power of your spirit and cause these ones to fulfill destiny even as it was written before the foundations of the world. Keep them from falling in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Congratulations, congratulations. Turn to your right, your, your right, which is my left. The counselors are waiting for you just to give you a word quickly and stay connected to you. God bless you richly. The counselors will address you quickly, very quickly. And then we'll pray for the sick. Very quickly. Keep clapping, keep clapping, keep clapping. The Bible says when one soul is saved, the angels celebrate. If the angels celebrate, house of treasures, why won't we celebrate? Give the Lord a shout! Thank you, Father. As I drop the microphone, I want to show you something. Tomorrow we'll get deeper. But just to show you that this is what you do every day of your life. Not necessarily in a conference. If you are trusting God for a touch, place your hand there. If you are trusting God for a touch, place your hand there. You have received something of God tonight. And one of the ways to demonstrate it is over circumstances. My goal is not necessarily to minister in the spirit now. I wanted to lay doctrinal foundation tonight. But I just exercise authority in one minute to show you something. So that when you go to your workplace, do it. And you will grow in it. Father, in the name of Jesus. And I'm going to speak calmly. So you know it's not. When the anointing is strong on you, you can shout. But it's not in the mechanical approach to it. I take authority over every tumor in their bodies right now. I command tumors to dematerialize in the name of Jesus. Tumors in the breast, tumors in the, in the neck, in the eye, any part of the body. I speak to you now in the name of Jesus. I command you to dematerialize. I say in the name of Jesus, I command you to dematerialize. Father, I speak over every eye condition here tonight. Whatever it is called, cataract, glaucoma, short-sightedness, long-sightedness, so long as it's been given a name, I decree in the name of Jesus 
eyes be healed. I say eyes be healed. I speak to every pain in the body. Joint pain, muscular distress, of all sorts. I take authority over you now. I command every pain, arthritis pain of every sort. In the name of Jesus, leave now. In the name of Jesus, leave now. In the name of Jesus, leave now. Every ear condition, I command you, receive your healing now. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Now imagine you have prayed for someone in the office where there is no so much several religious activity and you want to check if the authority of Jesus works. Believe in the name. Make the declaration and take the testimony. I know, like I know my name, that people have been healed. There are times when I'm under the anointing and I'm flowing by word of knowledge. I'm flowing by volatile operation. But many times, you will not be under the anointing. You will exercise your authority. That's the first thing I want you to go with from this conference. Before you return tomorrow, demonstrate it somewhere. Now, if you have noticed a change, lift your right hand. If you have noticed a change in your body, a tumor has left, a growth, a growth has gone, a pain has gone, something has happened to you, lift your right hand. You have noticed it, a physical, tangible change. Lift that hand. Be bold. Do it boldly. A pain has left you, a tumor has left you, an eye condition has been healed. Lift it. Now, look at hands up. I'm not taking testimonies. I'm just, I'm just showing you the practicals of what I've taught you. Can I see those hands one more time? If your hand is lifted, come to the right here. Just come to the right here. We are not taking testimonies. I just want you to see. Because sometimes you think some people are specially anointed. Yes, God anoints people specially. But every one of us have capacity to demonstrate God. This is the first night. Keep coming, keep coming. You have been touched. You notice the healing, tangible healing. Let's just shift to the right so that we honor the servants of God. Tangible healing. This is. Did you feel? Hope you were not feeling any emotion. You just exercise authority. I'm showing you. They are still coming. You will write your testimonies, we'll take some tomorrow. If we take testimonies now, we'll overshoot our time. But you'll be shocked some of the things that have happened to some of these people here. Can we give God a big hand? They are still coming. The proof that you have learned something tonight is that as you go, you will do likewise. How many of you will do likewise? Ministering from the revelation of who Christ is to you and trusting him. People are still coming. Can you imagine? Trusting him to touch them. Can we give Jesus a big hand as we receive God's servant to bless them? Come on, somebody give Jesus. Come on, give him praise in this place. Come on. Ah, is that how you celebrate the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Is anyone looking unto Jesus tonight? Come on, let's celebrate him. Glory to God. Woo. My God. What a night. I almost raptured to heaven. Apostle, you are brutal. Jehovah Shammah. 
You know, from the first day I heard him, I was like, wow. Where did this man come from? I remember my youth pastor came to me three years ago. And he says, there is a man called Apostle Michael Rockwell. I want to invite him for our youth conference. I said, oh, Rockwell, let me go and check. So I went to check. I said, uh-uh, there is something here. You remember? He said, Dad, I want, please, can you get him for us, the youth? And then last year, I said, okay, let him come. We'll have youth service in ownership conference. And um, unfortunately, he couldn't make it. But I tell you, this was God's timing. <laughs> Amazing. Wow. Every sentence was a dimension in the spirit. Thank you. Thank you for delivering such matured, elegant, refreshing word. Thank you. Thank you. You know, the one thing I love about him, I was telling Pastor Ike, I said, you know, I speak to him quite often. So, and the one thing, sir, 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 you know, so much respect. I'm like, no, man. How can somebody be so loaded and be so respectful? I said to him, you know, when you come, we want to receive from what God has given to you. He says, sir, no, I am coming to collect what God has given you. He said, what I am seeing God using you to do is alarming. And I want to receive. I said, hey, me, all the 21 days, we have been praying that whatever you came here with, you will not go back with. <laughs> That's why the burden was heavy tonight. It took you so much restraint to teach. But tomorrow, whatever you have left over, you must drop. Now, tomorrow morning, we are back here at 10 a.m. If I were you, if I were you, the, you, you know he listed five things that must never allow you to miss service tomorrow. Can you remember them? Don't allow them to make you miss tomorrow morning service. I beg you in the name of the Lord. He must finish what he started. He talked about the author and the finisher. Tomorrow he will represent that one. He will do what he said. The he started tonight. Tomorrow he will be the finisher of what he has started today. Say amen somebody. Can we honor God for the servant of God? Apostle Michael Oropo. Come on. Come on. Come on. Let's celebrate him. Celebrate him. Come on. Amen. We're going to close. Please go home. I know that we have been charged. So many of us, things have been said tonight. I pray you are in the spirit to catch them. This man only, he's, this is his first time in South Africa. And everything, everything that the nation is going through, he said it tonight. I entered South Africa 24 years ago. And the Lord told me two things. He said, listen, son, there are two spirits that rule this land. The first one he mentioned was the spirit of immorality. I can tell you, this is one spirit that if you don't conquer in South Africa, you will stay at the bottom of the barrel. He said there are two spirits. One is the spirit of immorality. It's the first thing he mentioned. The second is the spirit of violence. And he told me, he said, son, if you can keep these two spirits in check, your success will know no bounds. That is why I have put Satan where he belongs. I made a vow that no other woman will see my nakedness except my wife. So, we have kept some demons in charge. One day I was in my spirit, in my office. A woman came in. The gates were locked. Doors were locked. She came into my office. Pointed hand in my face. Why do you want this nation from me? I knew I had gotten to somewhere. You see, don't go back and begin to sleep with that girl you are not married to. Tonight, delete her number. 
sister, that man you are not married to, delete his number. That's what is keeping you down. Um, I tell you the truth, I lie not. So that you can dominate. It has slaughtered many pastors. Many. Many. Many, many mighty have fallen in this nation. I've been privileged to counsel many. And I'm telling you, don't be careless with your life. These spirits are real. They are real. The things you heard tonight are not fables. These are real stuff. That if you want to dominate in the land, they are demons you must keep in check on a consistent basis. If you don't, you will never rise. And so, tonight is just an intro. And tonight is just, just appetizer. Tomorrow we are coming back for the main course. For the main course. So, be back here at 10 a.m. Lift up your hands. One more time, give Jesus thanks. Give him the glory. For what he did tonight, give him thanks. Come on, somebody celebrate him. Give him the glory. Give him the praise. Thank you, Lord. We honor you, Father. In the name of Jesus. Now as you depart from here, I pray that the Lord himself assign angels to go ahead of you. And make every crooked place straight. Every one of you will get home safely. No evil is permitted to come near you. I plead the blood of the eternal covenant over your life. And I declare as one sent from God, you are blessed in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray and the church say, Amen. God bless you. I love you all. See you at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. Thanks for watching Revival Time Hub. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass, for he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was.